welcome to use the chat interface during the event. Uh, but we ask that all attendees remain respectful in your comments and observe the Acadia Code of Conduct. If attendees have a specific questions for the presenters, please use the Q&A um, function to ask your question. Thank you for your cooperation and participation, and we hope that you enjoy this Acadia 2021 session. We now um, come to the first of our keynote speakers, an event that I have the great honor of introducing. As mentioned earlier, we now found ourselves at a crucial inflection point in our relationship with design and technology. With a growing awareness of inequality, injustice, um, and complexities in the systems and infrastructures we use and design, we now ask, how could critical thinking be integrated with design and design thinking? What critical tools, theories, and processes might we make part of our practices in order to address questions of justice? How might we make space for and include non-Western per perspectives and context in our field? I can't think of five more appropriate figures to help us navigate through these entangled questions more than today's presenters. Our first speaker and respondent is Amelia Jones. Amelia Jones is Robert A. Day Professor and Vice Dean of Academic and Research in Ruski School of Art and Design, USC a feminist curator and theorist and historian of, of art and performance. Her recent publications include Seeing Differently, A History and Theory of Identification and Visual Arts, Otherwise, Imagining Queer Feminist Art Histories, co-edited with Erin Silver, The Catalog Queer Communion, um, Run 80, co-edited with Andy Campbell, which accompanies with retrospectives of 80s works at Participants Inc. and ICA in Los Angeles, has just been listed among best art books 2020 in the New York Times. Our second speaker, Leslie Ann Noel, is an assistant professor in Department of Design Studies at North Carolina State University. Her current work is situated at the intersection of equality, co-creation and futures thinking. Her research interests are emancipatory research centered around the perspective of those who would traditionally be excluded from research, community-led community research, design-based learning and design thinking. She, practice, um, she practices primarily in the area of social innovation, education and public health. She promotes greater critical awareness among designers and design students by introducing cr critical theory, concepts, and vocabulary into the design studio, for example, through the designer's critical alphabet. Our third speaker, um, Krzysztof Fodivsko, was born in 1943 in Warsaw, Poland, lives and works in New York City, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Warsaw. His projections on architectural facades and monument, as well as uh, especially designed performative instruments, give a public voice to the marginalized city residents. Krzysztof Wodiewsko has held retrospective exhibitions at numerous museums, and his work has been presented at Documenta, Venice Biennale, Vizny Biennale, and many other art festivals. He received the fourth Hiroshima Art Prize for his contribution as an international artist to world peace. He is a former director of the MIT Center for Advanced Visual Studies. Since 2010, he is a professor of art, design, and public domain at GSD Harvard. His work is being uh, uh, presented in a PBS series, Art in 21st Century. Our four speakers, Ron Real and Virginia Sanfrantello, are alchemist and architects behind the Oakland-based think tank Real San Fratello and the Make Tank Emerging Objects. A primary focus of their work folds together indigenous and traditional craft and material practice, contemporary design technologies, and a storytelling as a strategy to unravel the complexity of contemporary society. 
Humor, play, and hybridity are important aspects of work of Fran Sanfratello, often layered with serious topics that span the theme of themes of immigration, the startup companies, waste, homelessness, fashion, graphic design, and 3D printing. You can see their drawings, models, and objects in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, the, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Design Museum in London. Presentations um, and uh, responses by our guest will be followed by a conversation and Q&A if the time permits. With that, it's my great pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Amelia Jones. Welcome to Acadia, Amelia. Thank you so much, Benaz. If you could start my slides. Sure. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah, so if you could go to the first slide, I thought I would frame today's discussion of someone who really doesn't know very much about computational design, but I teach art and design at USC Roski, so I have kind of a broad view that I try to frame design for our students, and I thought I would introduce some of those ideas because it's very much my own work has been skewed towards the question of participation. Next slide, please. So I also wanted to take on what um, Banaz was suggesting as a political imperative to frame a very brief little historical introduction. I wanted to call in question our current practices and priorities um, as the panel suggests to address the urgency of the now. So as a framing device, I wanna argue that, the neutra that neutrality, in quote marks, the concept of neutrality is a key problem in discourses around design and computational systems, as well as around the visual arts. Next slide. So one of the things I stress in the teaching to denaturalize uh, conventional ideas of art and design is that design as such, like art as such, grew out of European modernism and is dominated by white people and white values with this whiteness ignored and naturalized. Design has tended to be defined in terms that assume a neutrality of context and perspective this, of course, is Western modernism. As Jen Wang has argued regarding Western design, quote, ignoring the social context that informs aesthetic choices and the political role of art and culture exemplifies the privilege of whiteness, a privilege that enables the white person as the voice of authority. Next slide. So given that we're also talking about the computational, I wanted to then tie in the whiteness of tech and tech discourse, which also ascends, tends to assume neutrality vis-a-vis -vis its makers and users. Computational design discourse takes the user into consideration, but is it inclusive? Algorithms are developed by people, Recent research demonstrates the racist, sexist, and otherwise exclusionary aspects of algorithm design. For example, the brand new book that just came out, Wendy Chun's, Chun's Discriminating Data. Next slide. So Euro-American design is beset by a history of ignoring the context of making the making but also ignoring the particularities of the reception and lived experience of design computational systems can reinforce this erasure since programmers and algorithms operate invisibly the hardware is designed to seem neutral and the discourse is falsely universalizing so the questions then become how can design be driven by ethical concerns such as issues of equity and social justice how can computational design or design in general avoid reinforcing white supremacy? How can design interrogate the logic of white supremacy at the base of ideas about 
modernist and algorithmic neutrality and truth? How can design develop new ways of thinking about the relation between the design and the user? And maybe that's where this work is most productively done. Next slide. Today, we'll look at this question, I'm sure, through a range of practices in relation to design strategies that might encourage a shift in perspective, strategies that attend to the politics of engagement in relation to the designed object, experience, image, or building. Can we say such strategies implicitly address intersectional audiences, refusing the modernist focus on the made object and the tech discourse tendency to imply neutral users at the expense of attending to particular embodied receivers or participants. And one example, uh, recently heard a wonderful lecture by Ellen Lupton about her show, um, The Senses, which addressed all sorts of modes of embodiment. Next slide. The key to addressing the complexity of audiences today is developing, I'm arguing polemically, relational strategies. So it makes sense to look at relational strategies adopted by artists uh, in an earlier period. This was a strategy that emerged with a lot of force in the 1960s. And so this is something I teach to the students to introduce them to the history of these strategies within a context of post-colonial civil rights and other identity movements. So I tie it very closely actually to the social and political concerns we're addressing here today. Um, and one of the theorists who goes deeply and directly into this is Edward Glissant in his Poetics of Relation, where he writes about the notion of the rhizome, which maintains the idea of rootedness, but avoids origins challenges that of a totalitarian root. Rhizomatic thought is the principle behind what he calls the poetics of relation, in which each and every identity is extended through a relationship with the other. Relationality or participation strategies in the visual arts then again, were precisely aimed at refusing the neutrality of whiteness that dominated art and culture in the West. Next slide. So I'm not gonna go deeply into these because I could talk about them all day and we have a time constraints, but Yoko Ono, Japanese woman in New York City, a mere 15 years, 20 years after the end of World War II as a highly charged subject entering into the art world. She does the piece cut piece in Kyoto and also in New York City, what, what would this mean for her to ask audiences to cut off her clothing? Something very highly charged, asking audiences to take responsibility for her body and social space. Next slide. Or Lija Clark working in Brazil and her work at this period really does straddle art and design where she's making objects that that encourage bodies to interrelate directly, such as goggles, relational objects. Next slide. Or her colleague, Ilya Oitachika, also from Brazil, making actually spatial designs that encourage art world participants to take a more active role in, uh, in the constitution and experience of the art world. Next slide. Um, and bringing in the tech, the explicitly tech element, um, the artist Lynn Hirschman Leeson invented an alternative self in the 1970s, which continues to this day to be articulated on multiple tech platforms. Next slide. So this brings us directly into also cybernetics, which was developing. The language of cybernetics, of course, was developing after World War II. And the idea of feedback loops, which relates to this concept of relationality and participation in the visual arts, where Lynn Hirschman is literally articulating an alternative self in relation to other subjects and social spaces in a kind of feedback loop. Next slide. 
And so there are these multiple dimensions through which Roberta is instantiated, including robotics, including um, social media, such as Second Life. And then, of course, if you go back historically, there are IRL examples where she's literally performing herself in public space. Next slide. And as we shift into the very contemporary era, of course, we can't speak about this without talking about Banaz's own work where she's developing articles of clothing or wearable objects that actually are computed to re respond literally to other people. So in this case, Caress of the Gaze, an interactive 3D printed wearable which detects other people's gazes and responds with this kind of prickly armor that's almost um, physically or materially enacting a refusal of the male gaze. And next slide. So in ending, I would just say that um, there's, there's also a whole other way to think about this legacy, and that is social practice work where artists again, straddle art and design and um, social work in a sense, working directly with communities to develop artistic projects and social spaces, such as the Crenshaw Dairy Mart. Uh, next slide. This is a group of three artists, Alex Doritz, Patrice Colors, who was one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, and Noe Olivos. These three people were former students of mine at USC Roski. So of course you always learn from your students. So what I'm saying is really building also on their work. And they've established this center in South Central in Ingles Inglewood called um, Crenshaw Dairy Mart on the roof of which is a, um, is a luminous sign. You can see it during the daytime on the left, but you also at night, they're under the flight path of LAX. So every airplane landing at LAX will see a giant lit up Black Lives Matter sign. So they're intervening directly in social space. They're also running all sorts of um, exhibitions, learning projects, et cetera, with the community. Next slide. And finally, the group uh, run by a local artist, Castles, and uh, in collaboration with Rafa Esparza, they worked with 80, a co coalition of 80 artists in the summer of 2020 on July 4th weekend and commissioned skywriters all over the country to write um, political phrases over architectural buildings that either relate to the uh, incarceration of immigrants or our major cultural centers. And here you have the phrase, care not cages, which is actually a Crenshaw Dairy Mart project as well. So one of the artists um, commissioned was referencing this other art space. So there's not only participation um, but there's a bringing in of, uh, you know, anyone for whom this sign is visible is part of this extended community. And final slide. So again, just to go back to this issue of really connectedness, where we're tying together certain activist ideals with strategies that in this case start to involve broader communities and create new forms of social space. So I will end there and uh, cede the floor. Thank you. Um, Leslie Ann, um, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna start sharing my presentation. Share and... Uh, Let's see if we went right. Okay. So um, thank you, Amelia, for that um, opening. Actually, I'm going to have to start my timer because I can talk for hours. <laughs> and I know that we don't have hours here. Um, but 
I wanted to share a little bit about emancipatory design or the way that I practice um, design, which I've um, started to call it emancipatory design, uh, but it's it's really building on emancipatory action research, which is another framework that actually exists. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about, you know, the theory around emancipatory design, um, uh, which is me combining emancipatory action research and, and design, and then show some examples from my work. Um, so a couple of years ago, I started using these terms, emancipatory design or, or design thinking and um, critical design thinking. And in both of these terms, I was thinking about um, critical thinking, which is about um, the way we think and we question knowledge, we ask questions, critical inquiry, critical theory, critical pedagogy and critical um, and critique, you know, and I was com combining all of these along the design process. Um, but I really started then with emancipatory research. Uh, and so that I'm going to describe that a little bit, but I like to start with this proverb, um, which I think really summarizes it very quickly. And it, the proverb is until the lion has his or her own storyteller, the hunter will always have the best part of the story. And so when I think about emancipatory research, I'm asking, okay, what is the story from the lion's perspective? Um, how would the lion tell their own story? Um, what are these stories that we haven't heard in the research um, or the, the design work that we're doing? And how can we make sure that these issues are coming to the forefront? What are the actual design questions or research questions that the lion is interested in and not just um, the outsider, um, what they're interested in? And the other influence in the way that I practice um, this kind of design is uh, work by Paulo Freire, um, work about liberation, um, and this book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which I recommend to a lot of designers, where one of the main um, ideas is about breaking um, what could be considered banking, uh, a banking style of education where people put knowledge into other people's heads and um, understanding that knowledge and expertise come from a lot of different places and we can work together um, to seek collective liberation, which I think is a really um, wonderful idea. And then another image that I'm going to show you is that if you have found um, the design justice principles and if you actually use these principles, you are probably already practicing in an emancipatory way, especially if you look at principle two, we center the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. So, you know, if you want to practice research in an emancipatory way, you can keep these design justice principles um, in mind. And actually you can sign on to the design justice principles on their website. When I checked last night, there were 2,200 designers from all over the world who had signed on and, and other designers, if they're interested, can, um, join forces with other people in, in the design justice network. So um, what is emancipatory research? Um, this other quote, nothing about us without us, uh, I think is really useful where it really highlights that the people who are involved in the research issue have to be very involved in determining the ideas um, and the questions that are going to be addressed. And so emancipatory research aims to create emancipation and social justice, correct the power imbalance in research design between privileged researchers in quotes and their research subjects from traditionally marginalized or oppressed groups. Um, and that, that's a wide range of people. And then it aims to shift power, redistribute power and share power. And even that one is kind of simple to keep in mind as you do your work. You know, you can ask yourself, where did you shift power in the work that you did? Or how did your work shift power? Uh, so some key points or aims to empower research participants, empower those without power, um, traditionally silenced voices must be included in the research process or I put in here in the design process, um, it aims to address power imbalances between the researchers and the research. It is about openness, participation, accountability, 
Um, and then there is the awareness that knowledge is historically and culturally situated. And then what we might consider to be truth, um, again in quotes, might only be truth because of historical situations. Um, so that recognition, um, recognition that truth is actually subjective, right? And um, the research process is compatible with the life experience of the participants. Um, so some more academic words, um, what are the ontological assumptions, multiple truths, knowledge isn't created only by the elite, um, multiple cultural lenses, understanding of power issues and empowerment, um, and that it is dialogic, dialectical, um, silence voices are included, it's participatory and political, and there's the analysis of power inequities, and it's linked to social action. So um, I found when I was doing my, um, my doctoral research, I, I found this, um, this research framework, uh, Critical Utopian Action Research, which is uh, from the Scandinavian action research um, tradition. And so a lot of the work that I do is tinged by this action research um, framework which I'm using in an emancipatory way to un try to uncover the issues that people that I'm working with think are significant. So the first question is about what is wrong, where um, the people who I'm working with are defining this for themselves. Um, and, and I forgot to include that I, I tend to work in a co-creation kind of way. Um, the next question is about where do we want to go? Um, where we are defining the utopia or the future that we are interested in. And then the last process question is about a design question. How can our dreams become reality where we co-design the way to get to the future that we want? Um, so a few experiments from work that I've done uh, influenced by this framework. Um, in Trinidad, I worked with some children where they identified the issues that they wanted to create their design work um, around. They also interviewed adults in their community and then discussed these and decided where they, they were going to place their design solutions. And then here's an example of one of those solutions. Um, funny to show this really low tech um, solution, I suppose in a high tech conference, but there is some element of tech here because this child designed a robo cleaner for the city um, because the, the town, I, I said city, but it's actually a village, you know, the village, one of the issues they identified was around litter. And then, you know, the child started to imagine what could the solution be um, based on that. Um, at, at another project that I've worked on, um, maybe a little bit less emancipatory, but it is about um, bringing in questions around populations that might be traditionally excluded. You know, I was I built this tool to get critical theory types of questions into the design studio and to get critical um, language into the design studio. So this is um some cards around critical theory and then cards around research methods again to demystify um the research process and make it more accessible to other people and then some more fun um design prompt cards and then these evolved into the critical alphabet which um has become pretty popular among designers and there is an app to go with it as well uh, another project that I um, developed also thinking about um, new questions, I suppose, that emancipatory approaches can bring in is this um, positionality wheel, where, again, I'm bringing these um, concepts into the design studio. Um, I guess you can say the area, my area of practice is design education. And so, you know, in this, by using this positionality wheel, we could start to have deep conversations about race, gender, sexuality, um, identity in general in the design studio. A few more examples before my time is up. 
Um, in New Orleans, um, we did a workshop between police and residents um, where we used this emancipatory approach, again, influenced by critical utopian action research and got the residents and police officers, only 12 residents and 12 police officers to identify issues that were important to both groups and then follow a co-creation process to um, start to propose some possible solutions to these issues while also working on their relationship, um, the relationship between the two communities. And the design question was, can we use design in the future to build sh shared experiences between the police and the community? Well, that was one question. And then the other question that they actually worked around during the day was, how might we um, improve the relationship between the community and the police? Uh, another emancipatory question, um, a resident in New Orleans actually came and proposed um, the, the topic that she wanted the class to focus on. You know, she said, okay, your, your, your university people are always coming into our community and telling us what you're going to research. Well, this is what we're interested in. And she wanted us to focus on health and well-being and designing a class around that. And then they also, um, the three residents who participated in this project played a really active role in also proposing the direction that the solutions would go, which was around things that were important to them, such as recipe, recipes, food, music, um, building community. Uh, and maybe the last example that I'll share today, um, in New Orleans, again, we were trying to see how we could use design methods to create like emancipatory or patient-centered um, outcomes in research. So we used different strategies such as, um, I do a lot of futures, uh, based work. So we, we created a scenario asking people to think about 2030 and COVID has been eradicated. What advice would they give people back in, in the past in 2019 to help them prepare? And so we were using these kind of design influenced, futures influenced strategies to try to get people to open up and talk more about what were the things that were significant to them um, so that, for example, a health um, agency could understand what where they should continue investing their time and research. Uh, and this is another um, example from that um, activity. And we did all of this stuff remotely on Mural, right? Um, oh, well, my last slide has come up. and I, I know my time is running out. Um, in Oakland and California, um, this is a workshop with teens trying to get them to talk about what, again, was significant to them and using that as the base to introduce um, uh, education around technology. So the emancipatory approach that was used was to get them to talk about um, superheroes and uh, um you know, fantasy, make-believe, stuff like that. And then link that, they made the link between this, the superpowers and technology. And then that led us to other conversations about um, getting them interested in tech. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I know it was um, just a lot of little examples that I was giving you to show that, you know, the, the whole idea of this emancipatory approach is to make sure then that the people who are in, invested, um, the people who are closest to the issue are involved in defining the issue, in brainstorming, in proposing solutions, in evaluating the solutions. Um, and, you know, sometimes that is something that we have to break as designers because we are very often trained to go and do this work as experts. But the idea of the emancipatory approach is that we're shifting power to the people who are most affected. And so that, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Leslie Ann. Um, the floor is on uh, to you, uh, Christoph. Um, well, thank you for inviting me for this uh, conference. Uh, um, you know, I've been uh, projecting slide and video images 
during the past uh, 40 years, but since 25 years, uh, during the past 25 years, actually, um, I've been projecting uh, sound and video images. Now, those uh, projections are participatory appropriations and animations of city existing symbolic structures. Um, um, by uh, by the silent and marginalized city inhabitants. That's very important. So uh, um, those projections, at least, an objective of them is to inspire and empower those people to share their experience and critical visions with others through the existing public space. But existing public space uh, of course, doesn't really work the way it's supposed to be uh, in itself uh, as a space of rights and a space for expanding and demanding uh, the access to such rights, uh, uh, rights to everybody. In fact, this demands the creation of the very special conditions for, for the inclusion of the voices of those who are socially marginalized and estranged. So that's the objective of my work, is to contribute to this process. Because in fact, the very well-being of public space as a stage and stake of democratic process uh, depends uh, primarily on those people's capacity to open uh, speech, for open speech and public expression. They should be first to receive the opportunity to open up and speak in the open and communicate the truth of their lives in the public space. So the, um, this process, of course, is difficult because those people are also silenced by the very experiences that they should be sharing with us because they are traumatized. So this, the, it requires a learning process for them to articulate and, 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 and express and convey emotionally charged voice and gestures. Uh, so to animate the monuments, one must learn how to animate oneself. And animating monuments help self-animation. And also it helps to animate the public space itself uh, and the democratic process for which that space is a stage and stake. So to illustrate this, I would like to present a short video document that might give you a glimpse uh, of, uh, of those projects. We'll start with, uh, with the project developed in Tijuana, uh, uh, California, Norte, in Mexico. So you could see here the building that was an uh, architectural site of this projection and special equipment, you know, that was uh, designed for those participants uh, to uh, speak, uh, to actually uh, engage the facade, uh, to turn the facade into the face or the face into the speaking facade in public space. So in this projection, uh, the women who have uh, immigrated uh, in search of work uh, from, uh, from uh, the other parts of Mexico, the South, and maybe also from uh, uh, even uh, in, in South America, they were talking about their uh, uh, traumatic experience of sexual abuse, work, workplace abuse, the police brutality. Um, so Tijuana for them is both the promised land and a nightmare. Sharing publicly memories of traumatic experiences uh, psychologically heals the person who speaks out. It heals at the same time the social numbness, silence and indifference about such abuse and violence among the public. I don't know if you can hear the, the sound. That's very important uh, because actually those projects would make no sense if there was no sound.
I'm sharing back. Sorry, my apologies. Policías y este y nos nos dijeron que bueno le dijeron a mi amigo a Héctor que iba a, a mucha velocidad. Entonces este le pidió dinero un policía y pues él se negó. Nos nos negamos porque no, no le dijimos que no era justo no no era justo que que pues que nos pidiera dinero no le íbamos a dar. Entonces nos pusimos al tú por tú le empezamos a decir cosas a los policías que no le íbamos a dar dinero y este y ellos empezaron a golpear a Héctor. Entonces lo golpearon como con con mucho coraje, con fuerza, patadas. Este le dieron con la pistola, con la pistola le pegaban en la cabeza, en donde fuera. Entonces nosotros por quererlo defender, un policía nos nos golpeó con, también con la cacha de la pistola. Y este y vivimos a Héctor tirado en el piso todo todo sangrado y este y, y le hablábamos pero no no nos contestaba Había quedado tonto por los golpes que le dieron. Perfecto. Uh, was also a projection of uh, undocumented immigrants called Sans Papier in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, production was in, in Basel. Uh, uh, the four undocumented immigrants agree to talk about their experience of life in Switzerland. The monumental scale of the production was significant as it seemingly legitimized illegitimate immigrants through the very fact that they appeared on um, the Kunstmuseum facade, one of the most prominent and prestigious cultural institutions in Basel and Switzerland. Due to, uh, to the lack of legal status and danger of deportation, their faces were not shown. The voices were altered uh, to be not easily recognizable. They were visible only from the waist down. And it seemed to be uh, as if they were sitting on the top of the building. The, the public was confronted with the experience of looking up, not down at those immigrants, not only to see the immigrants as larger than themselves, but also to, uh, to make uh, themselves feel smaller than them. I don't know if you can uh, uh, switch on the sound. Wenn die Leute mich fragen oder wollen, du kommst, das finde ich normal. Ich denke, die Leute wollen einfach mich kennenlernen. Das, ist, das gefällt mir auch. Ja, das ich 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 dann erzähle ich mich. Und äh, mein größter Wunsch wäre einfach, später einfach eine Breitung zu machen und auch äh, mein Berufsmotor anzuschließen. Ja, ich ja hier. Äh, ya de hace 10 años ilegal trabajo en diferentes casas limpiando y es venir a Madrid es muy bonito y es de mi colega todo es la de todo y es muy sencillo sin auto Ich 
ist man mit der Situation konfrontiert, dass die einfach ein paar Illegale oder Ausländer, die einfach da in der Schweiz sind. Das Einzige, was mich gefällt, ist, dass es das legal ist. Ich kann schon unterstützen, wo ich jetzt äh, bei Schweiz arbeite. Und ich habe auch viele Kollegen. Und vor allem ein Kollege von mir, der, der hat mir viel geholfen, der hat immer mir angerufen. Und ich war bei ihm, Familie, der hat mir gesagt, ja, du bist gerade wie mein Bruder. Du kannst jederzeit zu mir kommen, wenn du Probleme hast, wenn du etwas mit mir unterhalten Ich könnte mich dir dabei für dich. Gefallen bei den Politikern, irgendwie eine Lösung für die Sonnenpapierfrage finden. Weil wir sind also schon lange hier. So the next uh, projection uh, is more most recent. Uh, uh, it was called Monuments. It is it engaged uh, actually the refugees of civil wars and of armed violence who were speaking uh, Madison Square Park in Manhattan, in the center of Manhattan, through the uh, the sculptural monument of uh, Admiral. Uh, far out. But the real heroes of civil wars are not generals and admirals like Farragut, who was an admiral of, of American civil war, but the refugees of those wars and uh, the violence related to it. Even during this American civil war, uh, maybe nobody wants to remember this, but it was the largest refugee crisis of 19th century. So this uh, projection was actually uh, uh, helping those uh, refugees to uh, share their personal uh, experience, unspeakable experience, sometimes 50, 50, 15 or even more years in refugee camps and all of the abuse they suffered. They turned that personal experience into historical experience, standing on the pedestals here, sharing uh, their bodies, their presence with other historical statues. So uh, that was, of course, very uplifting for them experience. They re reinterrogate this kind of historical position of grand speakers uh, uh, once they were seeing themselves speaking as monuments and also seeing uh, others to listening to them in the middle of, uh, of Manhattan. So that is important uh, aspect of the work. Uh, and of course, I mentioned all those promise that public space hypothetically uh, is carrying on, but in practically without working on projects that animate public space and create discursive situations, public space becomes a private space of those who are depriving many people from the right to, to exercise and assert their communicative right. So maybe this little uh, uh, projection we didn't have time to hear, but uh, uh, that definitely uh, was uh, one of the series of projects I developed in which people were speaking through public statutes. Thank you very much, Crystal, for the wonderful presentation. Um, uh, we hand in to Ron and Virginia. Could you please share your screen? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ronald Rail, and this is Virginia San Fratello. And we are related to several organizations, Rail San Fratello, Emerging Objects Forest, and we hold positions at UC Berkeley and San Jose State University. And today we're going to talk about an arc of our work that relates to computation, but to talk about our larger practice, we often work on projects that are decidedly non-computational. We work in refugee shelters, uh, building uh, earthen ovens and improving spaces for education and cooking. Um, we work with communities to think about how design can improve their lives in, in rural environments and celebrate customs and traditions. And we also think about the ecological and humanitarian impacts of construction of the wall related to uh, binational relationships and identities. 
we use local materials often, and we think about the landscapes and places that we work in. We do not accept clients as a practice, but we like to think about how our practice builds upon prototypes that we can build, we can bring into the public in different ways, whether we're working with people on the ground or we're bringing it to marketplaces. And so we wanna talk a little bit about an arc of practice related to computational design that falls into these themes of local materials, working with communities, thinking about critical issues in culture and environment. And we're gonna begin with a project called The Cabin of 3D Printed Curiosities. So the cabin draws from local hardware, uh, the use of local software and some softwares we've developed ourselves and local materials here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, this is all, as Ron said, part of the ethos of our practice. Um, we started or we came up with the idea of building the cabin of 3D printed curiosities here in Oakland, California in 2018, when the cities of Berkeley, uh, Oakland and San Francisco all relaxed their building codes in response to the housing crisis. As many of you know, the cost of housing in the Bay Area has become so high that it is prohibitive for most people to have uh, accessible housing. And the building code uh, was relaxed. Um, homeowners and landowners can now uh, build up to 1,200 square feet without a design review. Uh, and this really opened the door for us, in this case, to experiment with some of the materials that we have been developing, some of the technologies that we have been uh, exploring over the last 10 years to create a test case to see how these materials would actually perform in the environment. So here you can see a side view of the cabin of 3D printed curiosities. The uh, east and west walls and the roof are made out of 3D printed ceramic tiles. And much of the, the clay is actually recycled here from uh, students working in art practice at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, that clay is supplemented by local clay from Northern California. Uh, we used a software called um, G-Code to create the loops or the textures and the pattern on what are the seed stitch tiles. And you can see the manufacturing process here, which uh, is an extruded paste uh, production to create these tiles. The front facade of the cabin is also made from uh, powders that are sourced here in the Bay Area. So the, the medium brown tiles are made out of sawdust from the Sierra Nevadas, which are close by. The dark brown tiles are made from Chardonnay grape skins and seeds, which are an agricultural waste from wine production in close by Sonoma. And we also sometimes use salt from the San Francisco Bay, another locally sourced and inexpensive material. Uh, these tiles are designed to hold succulents that thrive in the Northern California environment, uh, which you can see here, uh, the succulents are, are in fact thriving, but you can also see the patina of the tiles as they're starting to age over the years. And the building itself is set within a garden. And another reason we chose to put succulents in the tiles but now after uh, three or four years, you can see how the garden is starting to take over the building itself and integrate it into the landscape. Uh, the interior is made out of a 3D printed bioplastic, a corn-based bioplastic. It's backlit to be luminous. One of the things that we discovered through this process is that this material is always translucent. The patterns on the walls uh, are derived from a floral motifs, again, to connect the interior back to the exterior and to the nature surrounding the cabin itself. Uh, each of the tiles is unique, and this um, particular design motif kind of reflects the pressed in tiles that you might see in surrounding houses here in this neighborhood, which has many Edwardian buildings. Uh, the cabin holds other uh, curious objects, such as these 3D printed coffee pots and uh, Chardonnay wine goblets, again, made from our own uh, locally sourced recycled materials. So the coffee, for example, from the coffee grounds that one might consume in one's morning cup of coffee. Um, here we're extruding uh, bioplastic, so you can see the texture of the tiles themselves. Of course, the walls are luminous and backlit to change colors at different times of day. The furniture allows for 
different types of occupancy as one moves from day to night. And the moods and themes change throughout the course of the day and the evening. And we hope that this building is part of a new paradigm for thinking about how you build uh, in the Bay Area, in other places, a kind of backyard culture of do it yourself, uh, and thinking about the materials that we're using to construct the architecture of the future. We've, conti we've continued to build on uh, this research uh, through the development of uh, developing sawdust for 3D printing. Over 7 million tons of wood uh, end up in landfill in the United States alone each year. And we wondered if we could develop this material for additive manufacturing. So wood products could be created not through subtractive processes, but through additive. And we've been able to develop sawdust and wood flour uh, for additive manufacturing, which you can see here. One of the things that we like most about this is that depending on how you orient a 3D model in the 3D printer, you can create a kind of artificial wood grain, which is illustrated in this object. And we've continued to think about how we might create blocks and tiles that could be repeated and arrayed to make larger surfaces for interior partitions, which can be seen here. And we've taken this research out of our laboratory and started a company called Forest so that everyone can have access to this material, which is essentially free. So now anyone has the ability, an end user, a designer, an architect, to create products, interiors, and architecture out of sawdust waste. So we no longer have to cut down trees, but these items can be made sustainably going forward. This idea of using the materials that are around us, whether they are upcycled or they are natural resources, is something that fuels our work. And we are very interested in building one of the traditions of building with raw earth that we explore in some of our work along the US-Mexico border and in the expanded borderlands. And to think about how that soil, which is ubiquitous, can allow us to make uh, not only functional pottery, but perhaps even architecture. And we explored this first in an exercise that we called Mud Frontiers, where we traveled to the US-Mexico border uh, in El Paso and Juarez and worked with the University of Texas El Paso, along with 25 ceramic artists from Juarez and El Paso to discover sites of clay, locations where clay existed that could be used for pottery that were traditional sites, but also new sites that were discovered by the geology department at UTEP. And we discovered this beautiful complexion of clays from whites to browns, even greens in some cases. And in order to allow accessibility to the ceramic artists who were not familiar with 3D modeling or even 3D printing, we developed a small app that ran in the cloud, built upon Grasshopper on the back end, uh, that allowed anyone to just move some sliders and to create the G code to make pots. And we asked, each ceramic artist to make a pot. But over the course of the project, we were surprised that they produced almost 250 pots during that exercise of different designs and shapes and patterns. And we saw the power of enabling uh, people to engage software and 3D printing in new ways using a resource that is also fundamentally free um, and very local and has a profound meaning historically as well. And so these are some of the examples of the objects that they made. Um, and we have been taking Potterware to market. And so now it's used in high schools and colleges and ceramic centers all over the world. But we're also using it as a continued form of social practice, as they say. And we are working with homeless shelters here in Oakland and developing uh, with partners there the ability for youth to learn about strategies for creating startup companies and employment through the use of 3D printing and additive manufacturing in clay and pop-up shops to sell plants with an organization called Hort Culture. Uh, and we're also taking this technology to uh, immigrant shelters in Tijuana, and we're expanding it to Senegal, uh, I'm sorry, to Darfur and Uganda later this year, which is really exciting. But one of the goals of this endeavor, and even the back end of this software, 
is to think about how we can print very large and not only functional pottery, but think about how we might be able to make components for architecture or pieces of architecture or the architecture itself. Uh, a very idealistic goal is in fact this, to see how those objects that we made six or seven years ago that sort of caught fire in the ceramics world were actually study models to think about how we might make spaces and environments this way out of locally produced and sound soil. So we had to develop machines and partnered with an organization called 3D Potter with this first preliminary sketch that was made six years ago, uh, creating a product that they have now commercialized called the Potterbot, um, which uses a very low cost Scara arm to, to print many pots at simultaneously or one large object. And so once we had the software and the hardware, well, we had to think about how we could move large amounts of materials through a machine. So these are some early examples of that. But as we improved the technology and the precision and felt that the, 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 the triad of software, hardware, and materials had come to some moment of, of um, productivity, we moved that back out into the landscape. And we took it to the borderlands. And for the first time in history, uh, raw earth, adobe, is being 3D printed on this planet following 10,000 years of history in ways that we might rethink the nature of a material which is typically massive, but now can be seen as lightweight and inexpensive and not labor intensive and brings community and people together with the potential to think about how we might re-envision a future by imagining and utilizing a material that has been with us for 10,000 years. These experiments led to a recent project that we produced during COVID called Casa Covida. Uh, Covida meaning cohabitation, not COVID, but it was a house or prototype for a house built during the time of COVID for two people. And it takes on an understanding of space and program, but, but also explores realms of sculpture and art as well. There are three spaces and each have an individual program. One is a space for sleeping. Um, we worked with local artists to develop the textiles for these spaces that were woven from uh, local churro sheep. Um, a space for cooking and gathering around a hearth making functional pottery that we fired in the uh, structures themselves as kilns um, and clay harvested from the mountains in New Mexico. And a space for bathing and looking at the sky filled with the waters that flow nearby and from artesian wells deep within the ground. And because the borderlands are a space of hybridity we think about how we are bringing old technologies or traditions together with new technologies and new traditions and imagining the possibility for a roof, an inflatable roof that can respond to the occasional rains in the desert, but that imparts an amazing color on the interior, a kind of cherry on top to our explorations with people and materials and place. Thank you very much. So I'm going to ask some questions just to kick off a discussion. Everyone can hear me? Yeah. Um, this is all, I mean, maybe it's good that this is all so new to me. It's really exciting. and But it might be also odd the way that I ask questions. So feel free to reshape them. Um, but the thoughts that came out for me through these talks have to do with two axes. One is the axis of um, for whom the design or the artwork is being made and who may be ending up using it or appreciating it. And the other axis um, has something to do with what you just said, Ron, about hardware, software, and materials nexus. And it seems like those two areas kind of cross over all of these talks. So 
in terms of the question of um, for whom we are making these works or designs, I think it's it's easy to sit around talking about you know a kind of utopian idea of um, that Frarian idea of getting rid of a banking approach and talking to people so that they become enfranchised and become part of the project. And each of you are doing that in different ways. Um, I guess some questions that came to mind for me have to do with, for example, um, Leslie, your critique of truth as being, you know, something that is subjective really spoke to me because that's very much what I was talking about with the claims of neutrality with modernism is very much along those same lines. And I wondered like, what do we do? And this is an acute issue right now. What do we do when the people um, either want to claim their own truth, <laughs> um, which may be at complete odds with our values um, or when they literally claim something that we know not to be true, you know, so that I'm a post-structuralist, so I'm very uncomfortable with that nexus that's occurring where we feel like we need to be able to challenge people who are asserting something as true when it's not. You know, so maybe we'll start with that question, if it makes sense. What do you do when people want to want to claim authenticity or truth in a way that's at odds with what you believe to be progressive important valuable because i think that's the unspoken question with these utopian models whether they be of making or teaching is that you know we are coming into the room with the framework right so do we push back with the framework if we feel like the people we're working with or for are presenting something that we feel is extremely dangerous or unproductive. I'm not even sure how to respond, but you know, like, so I pull some of those slides from a class that I actually teach, right? And um so some of the slides that I did not use actually talk about critiques of emancipatory approaches. And there is a question, you know, what if the people that you're working with are actually not thinking in, a, in an emancipatory way? And and actually the question is, is really dealing with um, like people's own internalized oppression, you know, so like, you know, maybe you're talking about empowerment, but actually they've been conditioned to also oppress themselves. You know? And so I hadn't really, I, I have not really had to work with people who are um, against the process, but I know that we've discussed, we've discussed it in that kind of way. Um, I, I guess like my only experience with that is, you know, I have responded to calls for, um, calls for proposals where I could see in the way the proposal is originally framed that the approach is not emancipatory. It's not, you know, it, it's not aligned with my own values. And in one case, I was able to kind of successfully nudge the proposal back to something that aligned with what I was, um, with maybe my political values. So I, that, that's the only yeah. thing that I, I think I could yeah, suggest. No, I really appreciate that because that is that's an honest response because we all deal with, I mean, I don't have users other than the people who read my work, but we all have this in the classroom where, you know, we have a kind of contradiction between this idea of empowering the students, but then we all do push back sometimes because we're in, especially now I've really seen a huge shift with the volatile situation politically. Um, Christoph, or yeah, I, yeah. I have. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a material to show, which would probably illustrate what I'm trying to say in response to your very important point. Uh, because 
some of my recent projects are actually inviting people to speak from their heart and their stomach of their political and social cultural you know positions uh, coming from both uh, a conservative side and a liberal side uh, i think that what needs to be em emancipated here uh, is actually the dialogue itself uh, and the ability for people to listen to each other without fear and without preconceived notions uh, of what other person is thinking. Uh, first listen, then project your own image of the other. Uh, our new president actually called uh, in his inaugural speech, he called, uh, he appealed to us that we should listen to each other. You know, that's a very easy thing to say. Uh, yeah. But it is a good point, but how to do it, that's something that uh, all must require cultural projects in which that honesty, it is a trust involved enough so people can patiently listen to each other. Uh, the government itself, and that's my uh, critique of Biden's administration, has not set up truth and reconciliation traveling commission across the whole country to create situation for people could unleash their passions, their points of view, and patiently listen to each other without a violence or any, any kind of thing. Of course, uh, it's hard to imagine how to do it, but I am not the United States government. The government, however, has enormous resources that ha has not put in place to really help people to start learning how to listen to each other. But we, on cultural front or also in design areas, we can create artifices through which people cannot confront the uncanny even feelings. And, 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 and uh, you know, it's easier to say something that is, which is partially real or partially artificial. You know, the artifice is a very good vehicle through which we could, we could uh, communicate without much fear and resentment. So... Well, that's what I will, I'm trying to do. Right now I'm presenting a project in, in which two monuments, meaning two portraits of Washington, uh, George Washington, the same portrait, are actually speaking to each other with various points of view. And uh, the public is being caught in between, trying to, to really also recognize that inside of each of us, there's more than one position. We are not divided into party lines. There's a conservative aspects and liberal aspect, libertarian aspects, so socialist aspect, you know, in each of us. It's, we have to start listening to ourselves first, you know, in order to learn how to listen to each other. Artists can help. Yeah, I just have one further question for you, Christoph, is that, of course, when you come in with a design art idea, you're already over determining what people say, right? So, and in a sense, your voice is in tandem with their voice, like from, from a, you know, art world point of view, right? Like they would look at the piece as your work. So there's that difficult question of who speaks for whom are we facilitating or manipulating? And and I don't mean to suggest in any way that I think this is you, but no, that, that, the far end of the yeah. problem is is Facebook saying yeah, that it's just that, a that, neutral yeah. medium yeah. to connect. Just to clarify, the project in which uh, people were speaking through two replicas of uh, Lincoln Monument, they were coming from two parts of Staten Island the part that was vo voting for Trump, you know, and the opposite side, they shared the same studio and they started to speak. I didn't really ask them specific questions. It's the process of development, their own position that was part of the project. Uh, of course, I am not on uh, much of the conservative sides, but uh, I am on the side of the dialogue now. So I have to really keep quiet mm -hmm and open my heart, you know, and mind to, to the position with which I myself disagree. So I, I also, there's a limit to this. I, I, we cannot be so transparent and objective, but I try. And I mean, this is a new phase in my work. 
And before I was all only opening my work to those who are properly called as the oppressed. But I now see in Harvard University, the conservative students are observed, oppressed. There is no, no democracy in our university. They, they hardly really open up and speak. So well, um, that's a conversation we could have privately. <laughs> um, yeah, I was once asked I, have, by... I, have, I have approval of it because we opened a call for students to join the project to speak through Washington and the conservative students never showed up despite all of the efforts to encourage them and develop trust to the project. Right. What are your thoughts, Ron and Virginia, about because you're, I love the work is incredible, and I just wonder, like, are there frictions? Do you, you know, with this question of kind of coming into a community, how do you get to know people? What do you do with um, dissenting voices, or are there issues there? Um, well, the communities that we work in are largely our communities. Um, and communities that we, uh, particularly myself, have been a part of for thousands of years. And those become more specific, of course, like in the projects in El Paso and Juarez, where, where I might see myself as part of a larger community and diaspora, but we, on the project of the teeter-totter wall, for example, which of course had uh, immense amounts of frictions as well as support, that was a project that we worked with uh, an organization called Colectivo Chopeque, who who build uh, houses in Juarez for those who live at the extreme margins of society, the the truly oppressed, not the not the not the Harvard students who are oppressed, but like the seriously oppressed. Um, and so we work in those ways where we feel. I mean, we we've been part of that community. I would say for ten years before we uh, initiated uh, sticking three pink sticks to the wall. Um, but we also work with the American, um, uh, we work with an organization called the Light, for, formerly known as the American Refugee Committee. Um, and so they are on the ground and we work with them. So we, I mean, we decidedly work in, not in utopias or dystopias, I think we work in realities. And I think as, as public servants, as as educators who work for public research institutions, we are um, faced with the challenges of that, whether the economic challenges. And I think those economic challenges allowed us to develop research that was based on doing the most with the least. For example, uh, we are educators who very early on, 10 years ago, wanted to explore additive manufacturing. Uh, but could not afford machines and could not afford materials. And so we took on the challenge of inventing them ourselves. That led to uh, intellectual properties and patents uh, and uh, startup companies, but ways that we can allow others to make companies themselves using the software that we launch into the public. So it does get complicated. I think it does yeah. get complex, but I think we, we, we recognize that. We recognize all of the the challenges, the ethical and moral things that we have to, to deal with in navigating um, technology and culture and place in the 21st century. Can I ask a question about the Adobe? Because the artist Rafa Esparza, I mentioned briefly with the Insight project, um, mm -hmm. In Plain Sight, um, his work before that project, some of it was performance, and some of it was performing the make the hand making of Adobe bricks, um, because his father is an Adobe brick maker. So that's where I thought, wow, are there is there some ever any kind of resistance to the idea of machine making something that there's such a kind of, and that speaks to your raising the question of hardware, software, materials, you know, that is that ever an issue or is it just fully embraced? I mean, I've, I've been part of the earth building community for all my life. My, my father, grandfather, great grandfather, we all live, I live in an Adobe house uh, myself. We're actively restoring like seven Adobe buildings currently. Um, and so as, as part of that global community of earth and construction, 
there has been an ethos about how labor is good around the planet. Um, and does technology supplant labor is, a, is an important question. Um, there's, there's also the issue that uh, earthen building practices are disappearing all over the world and be supplanted by concrete building practices. And we understand what concrete building practices have done to our ecology around the world. Um, and so does a machine allow us to continue a 10,000 year old tradition is an important question. And is safety and construction also an important issue? Can we think about how robotic practices of construction might have certain qualities of safety that uh, labor practices don't? Can that allow people to do other things or learn other kinds of skills? So. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I think the, the robot arm is not uh, replacing a person. It's giving a person a, a safer job, right? With a different skill set. And like for myself, I mean, I can't pick up an Adobe brick and lift it over my head. It's too heavy but I can control the robot arm from my phone. So it allows me to make an Adobe building in a way that I would never have been able to before. I like yeah. very much uh, the word labor, uh, but I like to expand it to communicative labor, to, to building up ability for people to share with emotional charge what they really feel and explore what it is that ought to say to others of which they didn't think before. So to create some virtuosity in communication, it could also be interesting labor. And I think Paolo Freire would probably support this idea. That's nice, yeah. I'm gonna read a question in the Q and A um, by Imam Sheikh Ansari. Is designing for marginalized society the same as designing for privileged? And more importantly, since institutions presenting are critically the privileged ones, and more importantly, is democratic design the neutral design? <laughs> That's a lot. Yes, it's a lot. <laughs> um, I think that I've tried to stop maybe using the the I think marginalized is a loaded term, right? And so like when I think about emancipatory work, um, you know, like Ron and Virginia, you know, Ron, you just identified like the emancipatory nature of your work since you say that you're part of this community for generations, you know? So it's like that focusing the work. I think about the work for us by us but from many different communities, you know? So it's not necessarily us designing for the marginalized. Maybe we're designing for ourselves. And as design becomes much more diverse, um, you know, we will address the needs of many more communities. You know, um, I really often push back on us. When I say us, I mean designers designing just to help other people. Cause I think that there, there are some complicated things there, but I think we can also see how we make sure that there are many more voices that are present in the design community. And then new questions will emerge as new people are involved in design. So the Victor Papanek's book, the title maybe should be called Design with the Real World, not for the real world. But we still should learn from Papanek. It's an amazing book. And, and uh, so he was speaking from privileged position and being in academia himself, but he worked with people all over the world. So, uh, and I mean, so uh, it's an ethics, it's hard to follow. Fantastic. Yeah. Or so the combined Paulo Freire with Victor Fabian. And, but in contemporary world, with our new technologies and media, <laughs> probably would be great, uh, great uh, way to move ahead. Twelve or I don't know how many years ago. I guess eighteen years ago, when we started this collaboration together with Virginia and I, we uh, were very um, we, we admired the work of, of uh, 
endeavors like Rural Studio and Samuel Mockby and they were, who were doing things in the community and working with community. And I, I use those words, but we were not very good at that. And we tried for many, many years to do that kind of work. And it was hard. And I think it takes a certain personality and a certain, um, a certain kind of um, person to be able to accomplish that kind of work. And certainly people now in retrospect have also been critical of that work. But I think what, where we have landed most recently is that we do not think that we are designing with voices, but I think we think that we're maybe designing tools. And when you design a tool rather than design a building or a space for someone, then you are allowing those people to empower themselves with those tools, I think. So I think the software is a kind of tool and people do whatever they want with the tool. And they've done remarkable things with those tools. Uh, whether they're making sculpture or starting uh, um, like a like a business, a small business, or even um, the building of a mud oven, it's a tool that we all built together. But it's a tool for cooking, and so this idea of making tools versus making um, designing tools versus designing program buildings with mm -hmm. aesthetic uh, and you know decisions that come from top down, I think are are less interesting to us uh, imparting to communities. They're interesting for us as kind of uh, designers with egos, but I think the tools that we give are just tools that hopefully other people yeah. can use. Or designing process, right? What is the process for making a, a 3D printed sawdust building component? So you show someone how to do that and then they can make whatever they want, right? So you enable them. So designing tools of one process could create conditions for people to discover their new talents and abilities of which they were not aware before. You know, so and that is probably the most uh, uh, what we can expect from prosthetic kind of field and from tools and equipment and and uh, systems. Thank you all uh, for the wonderful session. Thank you, Amelia, Christophe, Leslie, Ron, and Virginia for a terrific session. This was absolutely uh, great. Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. This conversation can keep going, uh, and I hope that everyone is uh, as stimulated as I am. Uh, so we're going to have a quick break, um, five minutes, and our next session is a paper presentation on critical computation which will start after five minutes um, presentation. Thank you to our speakers and um, stay tuned. Thank, thank you, Bernard. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.